Championship Wrestling. Bringing you great wrestling action. Sanctioned by the NWA, National Wrestling Alliance. So, NWA Championship Wrestling, May 10th, 1986. Pre-show video was uh, Dusty Rhodes and Magnum TA under masks attacking Jim Cornette and threatening to put a lasso around his neck. Spoiler! They do spoil their own stuff sometimes. And he... The reaction to this after watching that three-hour ROH show was, man, wrestling crowds were better back then. (laughs) Dude, the heat for this was crazy. Tony Schiavone opens the show. This is so amazing. <laughs> Tony Schiavone, let me let me let me let me explain this to everybody. The Great American Bash Tour 1986 is coming up. Where they're going to go to all these different towns and all of these big buildings. And Tony Schiavone actually says, "We told you not to make your summer plans before you heard from us." If you were planning a family vacation, you had been alerted Oh, no. Do not make your plans until NWA tells you where they're going for the Great American Bash, because you're not going to want to miss it. And you know what? I'll bet there were people that held off on making their summer plans back then. Oh, absolutely. Because they did not want to miss if the Great American Bash was coming to there. Can you imagine nowadays? People don't even stay home for pay-per-views. They can just watch on the network later. Yes. We all have DVRs. (laughs) Yes. No one's not going to Hawaii for the summer because maybe Ra is coming to their town. No. Like, the whole idea of it is is hilarious. But that's how it was in 1986. He then brings out Robert Gibson for a solo promo. Oh. That's one of the worst ideas I've ever heard. If Maurice Cooper, who was a jobber in the next match, had done a promo afterwards, it would have been very similar to this promo that Robert Gibson cut because it was a total prelim guy promo. He promised Ricky would beat Ric Flair. He said Cornette and the Midnights would get what was coming to them. And he said all this in the most boring, absent-minded, unimpressive, uninspiring manner possible. Ron Garvin versus Maurice Cooper. A new jobber. Quite possibly my new favorite jobber. (laughs) The more I looked at him, the better it got. Skinny, pale legs. Let's just start from the ground up. Skinny, You start with your description, then I'll give my description. from, 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 from From toe to head, actually. Skinny pale legs, and above that you have the back fat bulging through his singlet. Then on top of that is his flat, hairy chest, his skinny arms, his mustache, and then the long hair with the bald spot. Like, the more I looked at him, the more amazing it got. <laughs> it's, like if you, it's like if they had filmed the movie The Wrestler, and they had called you to be a jobber, and you had to come up with a look. Like, you'd have done your best to do this. Like, God, I just I just wish that I could interview these old jobbers. Like, did you know what you were doing? Or was this just by coincidence? You were the best horrible wrestler of all time. And he was horrible. He was tall, gangly, and horrible. Like, the very first week of wrestling school bad. He was pale. He was wearing a horribly ill-fitting singlet. Yes. He was bald, and he was amazing. <laughs> he was you every, couldn't have made a better jobber. Every skinny, fat shop teacher you ever had in high school. If he'd have been a little fatter around the belly, he would have been pristine. So, in addition to being an eyesore, <laughs> wow, he also was a bad wrestler. Yeah, and he was screwing I that. He was screwing stuff up left and right. And finally, Garvin said, Garvin grabs a face lock, <laughs> and somehow they both just fall down. And Garvin just looks around like, what in the fuck have I gotten myself into? So he fucks up some more stuff, and then Garvin thinks to himself, okay, what's something I can do that will look okay that he cannot possibly screw up? I know. I'll do a giant swing. I'll just grab him by his feet and swing him around, let gravity do the rest. There's no way he can screw this up. And he hits this giant swing. He does five or six revolutions, and he lets go. And now Garvin's dizzy, and Garvin falls down. <laughs> and he gets up, he gets an elbow smash, and he wins. I'm going to go back and watch this all over again. In all caps, I wrote, this was enjoyable. Oh, yeah. Oh, it was great. I just love a match where you try something, and the guy sucks so bad that you decide, I'm going to put him in 100 holds 
and then I'm going to grab his legs and spin him, and then I'm going to drop something on him, and then win. Because that's literally all you could do with a guy like this. Yeah. Rage and Bull cut a promo that may have been longer than that angle that closed the Ring of Honor show. He starts talking about Ronnie Garvin, how tough he is, how he's going to get his hands on Tully Blanchard. He runs down Jimmy Valiant and Paul Jones's or excuse me, he runs down Paul Jones's army, says he's going to stand by Jimmy Valiant and fight beside him. And then he tells all the kids at home to say no to drugs. This is very important, he said, because drugs are the number one destroyer in the world besides all the other evils around. Yeah. And you know, when he puts it that way, he's right. Say no to drugs. The bull says no. You say no. <laughs> he also says you sh- he also said you should say no to Paul Jones. He went on and on and on, and eventually he was just done. I'm gonna take out all these bald headed geeks, whether it be the ball bearing or Taijo Khan. Wahoo Medea came out for a promo. Said Jimmy Garvin was hiding behind a woman. And Arn Anderson was a TV champion and a man to look up to, but now Arn has stuck his nose in Wahoo's business. They showed an angle where Precious had distracted Wahoo during a squash match. Garvin, Jimmy Garvin, had jumped Wahoo from behind and immediately gotten his ass kicked. But then Arn hit the ring and he and Garvin worked Wahoo over. Wahoo said he had no idea why Arn was sticking his nose in his business, but he was going to make him pay. And he was going to take the TV title. So reason the damn WWE network isn't working right now? I don't know. I click Vault. Yeah. Click NWA World Championship Wrestling. Yeah. Oh, now it works. Fuck you. Robert Gibson versus David Dellinger. Another new jobber. You've all seen a guy who push his opponent to the ropes and then do a drop down. His opponent will run over him. The guy will get back up and they'll do whatever's next. Dellinger does a drop down. Gibson hops over him. Gibson hits the ropes. He starts running. Dellinger hasn't gotten up yet. And he is so slow standing up. Gibson has to throw on the brakes and then just go on with something else. Now, you pointed out, in all likelihood, it's not so much that Dellinger was incapable of standing up, which is what I believed. I believe he just was not physically could not stand up quick enough to keep up with Robert Gibson, who wasn't going terribly fast. In all likelihood, he forgot the spot and froze in the headlights. All I know is that in this match, Dillinger, who I thought was a perfectly respectable physical specimen, botched the two most important spots, one being stand up and the other being stay down, because he fucked up the finish, too. Gibson won with a sunset flip. He tried. Yeah. He flipped over the guy, and the guy just laid there with a shoulder up, then another shoulder up, and he's desperately trying to get both shoulders down. God, what a bad jobber. <laughs> Dusty Rhodes and Magnum TA came out for a promo. Oh, this began something. This this led something down the line there. So Magnum's cutting this promo, and he's Magnum TA. He's got the big perned mullet, the mustache, some scars on his forehead. He says, I've been facing Nikita Koloff and Russian chain matches all over this country. And yeah, I've taken some lumps, and he points the scars in his head, but I'm still fighting, and I'm still a U.S. champion. And Dusty's there. He's got his big aviators on. He throws his arm around Magnum's shoulders and says, this man's so pretty. He's so pretty. I can't believe that we're all so lucky to, to, to wrestle with him. And I've been traveling up and down the road with him, him and the Perfect Ten baby doll. And we're all going to get our hands on Jim Cornette and the Midnight Express. We're going to take the Midnight Tag Titles. Magnum was so embarrassed. He's trying <laughs> so hard not to laugh. Some lucky girl in TV land. That's what this is. It's going to hang him up one of these days. Magnum's like, <laughs> Nikita Koloff versus Tony Zane. I don't know if I've mentioned this before or if this is the first time I realized this, but Tony Zane act, looks exactly like early 80s version Adrian Adonis. He does not work like early 80s version Adrian Adonis, which is too bad. He was physically horrendous, but as a worker, he was Ricky Steamboat compared to that last numbskull. Well, that's true. So Nikita must have liked him because he gave him a ridiculous amount of offense considering he's Nikita. And he won with a sickle, and I guess what Nikita liked was that Zane sold this by flipping over and landing on the back of his neck. Shivani interviewed Jim Crockett and Sandy, and I didn't get Sandy's last name, and it's somebody I should know. Sandy Scott? Sandy Scott. 
So they're there to plug the Great American Bash, which is the tour of shows and outdoor stadiums all over the country. Now, I've been waiting for this. A month or two ago, my cat runs behind the TV. Some cables get unplugged. I got to reorganize everything. So I'm reorganizing everything, and I go to make sure that my uh, Xbox is still plugged in and the internet's still working. And I, to test this, I just loaded up a random show, NWA Championship Wrestling for the summer of 86. I wasn't thinking anything. I just picked one show and hit play to see if it worked. Wait till we get to these shows. Oh, I can imagine. The venues they're in, the talent they have, it's a sight to behold. Well, hey, they told you, don't make your goddamn summer plans until you hear from us. It's the treats we are in for the next two or three months. I can't wait. Hey, we were in for treats tonight. Yes. So they plugged shows in Philadelphia, D.C., Atlanta, Cincinnati, Jacksonville, and more I couldn't write down. In order to bash 85, in addition to great wrestling action, you also had fireworks and skydivers and country music stars. They plugged appearances by David Allen Coe and Waylon Jennings. Holy smokes. Waylon Mercy's going to be there? No. Oh, Waylon. Actually, yes. might, actually, but maybe. Tully Blanchard versus Rocky King, and this week's example of goddamn Tully Blanchard was great. Dude, this was a totally fine little match, and Rocky King deserved much better than this. Rocky King was a guy who went on TV every week. Sometimes he looked good, sometimes he looked bad, but he never, ever, ever won. I don't want to say Tully had them convinced he was going to win. But when Rocky gave his comebacks and was punching the crap out of Tully, these people were so into it. They were really thinking Rocky could hold his own with Tully Blanchard. Three minutes later, they were proven wrong. Tully won with a slingshot suplex. He was great. Cornette came out for a promo. He was ripping on Dusty and Magnum. Said they were hiding under masks, calling themselves the James Gang. They re-aired the video that opened the show, so here's how it ended. The James Gang, which is in fact Dusty and Magnum under masks, they come out, they beat up the Midnight Express, they put a rope around Jim Cornette's neck, they carry him out of the ring, they take him into a parking lot, and they lay him down on the ground, and they take the rope that's around his neck and tie it to a pickup truck. <laughs> Baby doll is in the truck, and they are about to kill him. They're going to hang him. They're going to drag him. They're going to hang him, him and drag him behind this vehicle here. Yeah. And literally... The car is moving when they stop the film. <laughs> yes, the film just stops. I was like, oh my God, we almost witnessed a murder on national television. And because it's Jim Cornette, no one gives a shit. No. I guess you're, you're allowed to, you're allowed to public, publicly kill pe people if they're mean. If they deserve it. You I, can assassinate he, them on live television he, in NWA. He needed killing. Now, even if I hadn't known the Dusty and Magnum we're the James gang, the James boys. Dusty is leaving the building, and you only see him from behind, and he's wearing his duster and his cowboy hat. It was so unmistakably Dusty Rhodes. Oh, yeah. Like, it couldn't have been anybody else in the world. And you couldn't see a thing. He was wearing a hat and a duster. But his physique and the way he moves, there's no one else in the world it could have been. No way. Not one man gang. Not Big Bubba Rogers, not any other fat guy. It was unmistakably Dusty Rhodes. So Cornette says this is not the old West. You can't get away with this kind of thing anymore. So they want to fight dirty. The Express can fight dirty too. And to show it to you, here's beautiful Bobby and Loverboy Dennis, the Midnight Express. <laughs> Boy, did they show us. Oh, my God. Randy fucking Mulkey. Has anyone seen this man in the ensuing 30 years? He's alive. They're around. There's no way he's alive. He came out I may die after watching this. He came out with a farmer's tan. This could not have been an accident by this farmer's tan. No, of course not. It was way too deep. This is a professional farmer tan. He takes a big backdrop, and I thought, man, not a bad bump for this here mulkey. Landed safely. Very good. And then he is thrown through the top and the middle rope to the outside, and he lands right on his ass and tailbone on the cement. Yeah. I thought he's dead. But he, no. He goes flying out there. <laughs> and like you say, he, he goes flying under the bottom rope. So it doesn't sound that bad. You've all seen guys who flying out of the ring. But he do, he does this almost like he's doing a... F uh, who did that flip dive through the ropes? Aries used to or somebody? Homicide. A lot of guys. Homicide, Homicide. used to do a flip dive through the ropes. And he'd always... You know, there's a guy there to catch him and bounce off of him. So he'd sort of land on his feet. 
looked like the monkey was trying to do that, but there was no one there, so he just lands on his tailbone on the cement. I'd never walk again. Let me give you a lesson here. I'm not a I'm not a a physicist. I'm just going to give this to you in layman's terms. We've all been to the gym, except Vinny. Everybody knows the bar that you put the weights on. That thing weighs 45 pounds. Now imagine, Vinny, if you were laying down and I just took that bar and I laid it across your chest. You'd be fine. Right? Yes. Now let's say that I took one end of it and I sharpened it like a spear and I tilted it on its end and I put the sharp part right on your stomach and I let go of all 45 pounds. I'd be worse. You'd be a skewer. Yeah. Because of the surface area. Yes. So when you land on your goddamn tailbone and nothing else on the cement, they may as well dig your grave. The pounds per square inch on his tailbone was high. So he's dead, but no. There's not more. They come out and, and Bobby Eaton grabs him and he lifts him in the air and he hits him with a vertical suplex on the cement. And it sounds like this. A splat of flesh on cement. Now what's funny is, before, it was a very small area, his tailbone, that impacted the ground, and I thought he died. This time, the impact was spread over his entire body, which should be much, much safer, but now I really thought he was dead. Because of the sound. There's a way you can do a suplex and sort of protect the guy. Well, you take part of the impact yourself. And uh, Eden went down, but he lifts this guy up for a suplex, and then when he starts to fall backwards, he just lets go. And Randy Mulkey fell from head height to flat back bump on cement. And yeah. <laughs> go just drop raw meat on the floor. That's what it sounds like. A big a big you gotta do You gotta do a 200 pound piece of raw meat. Yeah. Although the Mulkeys weren't close to 200 pounds. But 150 you know. pound piece of meat. Sure. So then he tags in the other Mulkey... Bill Mulkey, it's his time to die. And the other Mulkey, Randy, is dead on the apron. He vanishes. Yeah. I they, thought he was crippled. They said this guy, he can't even stand up in his corner. But then you know what? He fucking tagged back in. And when the guy tagged back in, I thought, you deserve whatever you get from yes. this point forward. Not buddy. only did he tag in, not only did he tag in, he started throwing punches. What the fuck, dude? He was, Don't poke the bear. He was hit with the skull-crushing finale, yes. which in fact looks fucking awesome <laughs> yes. when it is performed. By a talented wrestler. By a talented wrestler. And literally, it was so awesome. He hits the move, and the referee drops to his knees. And before the referee can even count, Bobby Eaton is sauntering into the ring with the tag belts. And Jim Cornette is getting on the apron to get inside. Yeah. And the referee sees he's been entering the ring, but it's like, fuck, one, two, three, end this fucking thing. Everybody knew the man was dead. Everybody knew it was over. It was acknowledged. And everyone just started moving on with their lives even before the three count had been accomplished. I mean, when he tagged in and started throwing these punches, they said, all right, I guess you're okay. And they slammed him and they suplexed him and they threw him down on his back over and over and over again. Hit the big elbow, the skull-crushing finale, and pinned him. Ugh. Oh. That was seriously like the worst pair of bumps in one match until Mick Foley climbed on top of that stupid cell. So far. Yeah. <laughs> There's still 10 years, Vinny. I guess. So Cornette then cuts a promo on Bob Geigel and Jim Crockett. Apparently, the James gang had beaten the Men Express at some point. He wanted the results of that match overturned because clearly that's the, uh, Dusty Rhodes and Magnum T under masks. So Crockett comes out, says, no, no, the revol results of that match can stand. Unless you can prove that the James boys are, in fact, America's team wearing masks. Now, was it that or was it just when they interfered that it cost the Midnight Express the match? He wanted some match result overturned. Yeah, maybe the one from the opener or from the, the, the thing we just saw. Maybe, I don't know. I, I wasn't don't, paying that much attention. The, the key is. Yes. The, the angle, which Dusty loved to do. I can think off the top of my head, there's at least a third example of this I can think of. The baby faces are wearing masks. The bad bad guys have to remove the masks. And if the bad guys, bad guys can remove the masks, the baby faces are in trouble. That's right. Jim Crockett Sr. essentially said, or Jim Crockett Jr., if you can prove that these two men are Dusty and Magnum, I will reverse the decision. But otherwise, I'm just believing they're the James boys. That's right. <laughs> it's like, wow. 
They came in and signed contracts under masks. Sure. They didn't question them. No ID. That's hey, that in the old days, the masked wrestlers, people would 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 ask the question, how do they cash the check? Mm-hmm. And I can't remember who it was, but their answer was, all I know is I write a check out to the Midnight Rider. Yeah. And he gets it cashed. <laughs> it's go. not on me. But yes, we had the James Gang here. We had the Midnight Rider a year or two after this. We had the Yellow Dog in the 90s. It's a classic angle. Ric Flair and Arn Anderson versus Carl Stiles and Bob Owens. It was long. It wasn't bad. It was Flair and Arn, for God's sake. By the book, tag team action. Yes. And Flair squashed the guy and won with a figure four. And then he cuts a promo. And he says, this is the world championship belt. It costs $40,000. Holy shit. Gold and silver and diamonds and rubies. And as he's talking about how great it is, how important it is, they zoom in on the belt, and you can see the nameplate that clearly says, Rick with a K, Flair. Oops. When you spend $40,000, you don't need to get that nameplate fixed. They did not spend the extra $1,000 on an editor. If you're going to give me a mic that costs $40,000, you can spell my name with an I. Right. I'll be cool with that. He said, I have this belt. That means I can talk about my women. I can talk about clothes. I can talk about my yachts. I can talk about airplanes. And poor little Ricky Morton, you're stuck with a teeny boppers and training underwear. So he's going to be champ for a Flair long time. Flair loves that comment. He does. He must have said it one time and thought he was so funny that now it's part of his lexicon. It might be. Talked about how great the horsemen were and the Midnight Express were and the Koloffs were. Said he's taking out Dusty Rhodes. He's going to take out Ricky Morton. When he's done with that, he's going to beat up a road warrior just to show he could do it. Hey, he could today. He was all jacked up with abs. Oh, yeah. Just got back from the beach tanning, he said. That's right. Driving Among a little crazy things. there, too. Yeah. Rage and Bull and Jimmy Valiant came out for a promo. I love this because <laughs> after the Flair interview, the on-screen graphic. You know, they always have the on-screen graphic. Yes. The on-screen graphic says, and I quote, more to come and it's all action. Stay tuned. So when I heard that, I thought, I'll bet you anything they come back with an interview segment. And so I can make fun of them for claiming it's going to be all action when they come back. So I was fixing to blow when who should be there for the interview but Jimmy Valiant. And in fact, they were fucking right. It was all action. It was an all action promo. Valiant has a new shirt. On the front, it reads Pistol Pez Watley. On the back, it reads Will Be a Bald Headed Geek. I bet those goddamn things would still sell at Cauliflower Alley today. Probably would. So, actually, that's a good point. My favorite part of this one, he's being all crazy Jimmy Valiant. He's also addressing his partner here at Rage and Bull. Now, if you've watched these, they usually call this man Rage and Bull. About 20% of the time, they call him by his given name, Manny Fernandez. Valiant didn't call him by either of those names. Valiant called him Willy Willy. <laughs> over and over again. Willy Willy. Willy Willy. I thought you were going to say he was going to call him, like, Raging Fernandez. No, that would have made sense. Or Manny Bull. Manny Bull. So we got Jimmy Valiant and Willie Willie versus Larry Clark and Paul Garner. I was so disappointed. Valiant never tagged in. Flying Burrito and to the back. Fans retaining bald-headed geek. Jim Crockett and Magnum T.A. cut a promo. Do you remember when we used to watch Primetime Wrestling and Tito Santana would do matches and he'd hit the flying forearm, and Bobby Heenan would call the flying burrito, and Gorilla Monsoon would roundly chastise him. <laughs> this was like maybe four years later. Yeah. And here we are, and that's what... I'm, we're not even... This is not a joke, guys, that aren't following us along. They called his finish the flying burrito. Because he's Mexican. Oh. <laughs> he's Manny Fernandez. Flying burrito. No one knew what a chimichanga was then. Not ironically. Yeah. He was a baby face, and his finish was the flying burrito yes. here in 1986. Jim Crockett and Magnum T.A. cut a promo. Considering a contract, Magnum had signed to face Nikita for the U.S. title. So they announced that's the subject matter. And then what they have to say about this contract is, we'll tell you more next week. Seriously, that was the whole thing. Yep. Paul Jones Army came out for a promo. It's time for our audio clip of the week. <laughs> Yay! It's not Paul Jones's time because he had almost nothing to say. He mentioned something about proper gander <laughs> and then threw it to the Baron, <laughs> yeah. who's a cartoon character. But then 
We got real... Yes. Before you hit play. My favorite part of this is when he vows Jimmy Valiant will be a bald-headed geek. Tell him Baron, and the camera pans over to Baron, and there's not a hair on his head to be seen. <laughs> that is irony. Yes. Well, let's hear from Shaska Watley. Snip, snip, snip. Tell your That's Baron. That. Tell I Manny coming, Fernandez Tank. that, or whoever else you get. Right, Cheska? That's right, Baron. And let me tell you what this is. This is just happening. I don't know what's going to be happening to you, Jimmy Valiant. And you, Manny Fernandez. I'm going to tell you what, he ain't nothing but an off brand colored boy anyway. And I'm the one that said it. And I'm going to tell you another thing. If you think that you're going to make this pretty hair up here, I got news for you, sucker. I ain't going bald. I ain't going bald. I got good hair. You the one with horse hair. I'm going to take it all off. And Manny Fernandez, I ain't never one of no chihuahua dog, but my dog needs a little hair too. And I'll get some from you, sucker. Call Joe Aside Zarr from calling him an off-brand colored boy. Yeah. Did you miss that the first time? I did. I did not. <laughs> <laughs> what the fuck? Yeah, you can say things in 1986 on TV that you can't anymore, and that's not a bad thing. You probably shouldn't be calling people that on TV these days. That's still a hell of a promo. Yes. My God. Hey, was it because he was short? How did Shaska not go to the very top? I don't know. Man. So it led to... I mean, he looks like a goddamn idiot right here. Well, it was... But he's a heel. He's got his white top hot askew, his white... Uh, jacket and tails, no shirt, and his wrestling gear. Man, what a promo. That's a great promo. And it led to those three, the ball bearing, Baron Von Rasky and uh, Shaska Watley versus Art Pritz. Can we just talk about these three, by the way? I can talk about them all night. We got Baron Von <laughs> Rasky, got? who looks like an animated villain come to life. We got Shaska Watley in his tux top, white tux, by the way. His trunks pulled up above his navel and his top hat on. We've got number one Paul Jones dressed as an army colonel. A, a commandant. A commandante. And we've got a fucking barbarian. Here's how I would describe Baron Von Raschke to you if you've never seen him. Go to Google. Do a search for the word troll. The first image that comes up looks exactly like him. Yeah, try this. Give it a shot. That is what he looks like with ears. He has ears. That's a difference. <laughs> this drawing? Yes. Huh. That's what Baron Von Rasky looks like. What about the second row, fourth from the left? Is that... Uh, the would... with the sombrero? <laughs> yeah. Is that the flying burrito? Perhaps that is the raging bull. Oh, Vinny. What? That's what he called him. I called it the fly... That was his finish. Anyway. What else are you talking about? Oh, the barbarian. The ball bearing. So... They're doing this match. And Barbarian's just press slamming dudes and kicking them left and right and looking great. And he throws Pritz into the ropes and he hits a big boot. The greatest spot of 2016. And I realize that this took place in 1986. Doesn't matter. Can I describe this? I think you should. Okay. First off, his gimmick is he's the Barbarian. When you think of a Barbarian, you don't think of a man who could do the splits on a ballet bar. No. But the Barbarian can. He swings it. You know what it looked like? It looked like you. When you used to do that giant big boot, I couldn't believe you got your big fat leg up so high. I thank you. It went above your own head. That's 6'3". Yeah. yeah. That's a long fucking way up in the air. Barbarian throws his damn leg up high in the air, and he takes this guy out. And the guy takes a bump right in front of him, which you're not supposed to do. So Barbarian is a little bit crowded. But he has not lost his balance. He is still perfectly balanced, and he puts his foot on the ground. Now, they're very close to the ropes. He is between the man and the ropes, and he has thrown this boot, and the man has fallen right next to him. Now, what the barbarian could do is he could step over the man. He could walk around the man. He could go to the other side and then make a cover. But instead, the barbarian decides, fuck it. I'm going to leap in the air and just fall on the man looking like I've lost my balance and I'm out of control. Yes. I laughed so hard. I rewound it over and over again. It was the funniest fucking thing I've ever seen. <laughs> you can see the exact moment where he said, I'm going to let go of these ropes and fall. And he threw his hands in the sky and went, Rawr! 
oh, and fell down on the man. Because why not? Because why not? And they went on to win with his diving headbutt. 55 minutes into the show, everyone. You should all go watch this spot. Koloff's got a promo. We haven't even talked about Butch Brennigan. He was a terrible jobber. He's a new jobber. We haven't seen him yet, at least yeah. when we've been reviewing the show. His name is Butch Brennigan. He absolutely sucks, but he is perfectly capable of flying through the air and being killed. I wonder if this is like when... Uh, like WWE, they call up a bunch of guys after WrestleMania and always let a bunch of guys go. Yeah, let's call up some new jobbers. And let the old jobbers go. I don't know. There was no George South this week. This match was more entertaining than any match on the Ring of Honor pay-per-view. All because of the ball bearing and Butch Brennigan being absolutely horrible. And Art Pritz being in there and Kent Glover. And everything about it. <laughs> I was just going to keep going, but let's consolidate it. <laughs> Koloff's got a promo. Ivan's going on about how the Russians would headline every Bash, Bash 86 show, just like they had headlined Bash 85, but this time Nikita would be U.S. champion. And then Nikita spoke, I think. He did a Koloff promo. I got no idea what he said. Why did they bother? Gorgeous Jimmy Garvin versus Jim Dawson. They were low on time. Garvin won with a brain buster in about 15 seconds. And he cuts a promo with Shivani. <laughs> God. Oh, what a promo this was. He must have been in the back. <laughs> For an hour. I don't know. Now, listen. When Dusty Rhodes came out and he put his arm around Magnum and he started talking about how there's some girl out there in TV land that's going to make you her prize or whatever he said. I strongly suspect that nobody saw that coming. It was just Dusty going into business for himself. Oh, yeah. But Jimmy Garvin's in the back, and he's watching on the monitor or whatever. Maybe he's just looking through the curtain. Maybe they didn't have a monitor. And he sees Dusty put his arm around Magnum, and his the wheels started to turn. Oh, yeah. And he turned it into a whole promo. He comes over and says, listen, I got to say, I was watching this show earlier, and now I got sick. It was sickening to see America's team out here. One man with his arm around another, calling him pretty? By the way, Jimmy Garvin's whole gimmick is he's pretty. That's right. Yeah. But he gets to say it. He does, and Precious does. Yes. Not another man. No. God forbid. He was so sickening to see the two men hugging each other and calling each other pretty, he almost came out to smack the two of them. He got... <laughs> Can you imagine? <laughs> he got through that. He says he can't believe... Wahoo is now talking about Arn Anderson. I guess I'm invisible, he says. Wahoo can't see me anymore. I mean, listen, it wasn't even like he wanted to say something like, you know, I'm not a fan of this kind of lifestyle. No. He saw a man mm -hmm. hug another man. Yes. And it sent him into a rage. And he almost went out and attacked them. When you put it that way. That's what he said. It does come off like a hate crime. That is exactly what he said. It's very much like a hate crime. His delivery seemed far less terrible. Well, he turned into a wacky promo. It was, yes. But what he was essentially saying was, I was so sickened by this public display of male affection yes. that I almost had to come out and beat two asses. Yes. But I was so disgusted, I couldn't leave my dressing room. Yeah. So he doesn't want and does not want Wahoo ignoring him. Says he only put his hands on Wahoo because Wahoo was cursing around his wife. And they wrap it up the show and he says, fans, I want to let you all know there will be no more guys hugging guys on TBS. <laughs> on a wrestling show, mind you. And he closed the show with a big kiss for his wife. 1986, everybody. It's a different time. 1986. And you use the words off-brand colored boy. <laughs> NBC. What does that even mean? <laughs> I assume your skin is darker than See, any white person, but not as dark as mine. I heard it, and then I was like, oh, 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 what? Anyway, 1986. That was the show. That was the show, all right. That really was a show. I don't know if they were supposed to go another 30 minutes, and then Garvin just got the whole show shut down, <laughs> or what happened right here. Between between Garvin and, and uh, Shaska... They were just like, let's put on Andy Griffith. We'll try this again next week. You're going to be mine all night long. Woo! Embarrassing. And by he, I mean me. 
<laughs> you know, when you watch the show and the social outcasts come out and you just want to leave the room or shut off the television show? Nothing like that on these shows. Good family wrestling shows, these three. NXT was a good show. All right. Uh, Lucha or NWA? Let's do NWA. May 17th, 1986. The announcers tried to run down the show, but they were interrupted by Jim Cornette. He said he had a peace offering for Baby Doll, the Mama Cass workout video. Oh, man. Did he have to? Very tasteless joke. But more importantly, this is 1986, and this just had a flashback because he actually presented a VHS tape. Yes. Which I know many people listening have never actually touched, but they were big. They were much larger than your... I don't even know what to describe them as. But more to the point... When you went to the video store in 1986... I knew you were going to bring this up. Video tapes were stored in these enormous book-like cases. Yeah. These thick, black, fold-over cases that were... You know, a, a video tape is, I don't know, an inch tall and eight inches long. This tape... Ad- the, the tape case adds four inches in all directions. It's huge. You can but, kill a horse with a VHS tape. But when you went to the store to buy them... They usually came in cardboard sleeves. Right. The plastic VHS case was fancy. That's right. That is right. I do remember back in the day when I was in high school and I was in video production class and we made a couple of movies because that was one of the things you got to do. That's the only reason I did that class was you got to go out and get the camera and make movies. And man, when I actually got to take one of my movies and edit, edit it together... Which, by the way, back in the day, what you had to do was you had to get this big machine that probably cost $5,000. And on one side, you could slide in one VHS tape. And on the other side, you could slide in another one. And the one on the right was the master. And what you would have to do is you would have to dub from the left to the right only the stuff you wanted and in a very specific order. Which, by the way, when you dub from one side to the other, you took a generation of quality away from it. Yes. People are listening to this right now going... Had you invented fire yet? But anyway, I would edit these movies together, and then I got to put them in that plastic case that you would get if you went to actually rent a video at the video store. And I was like, man, it's so awesome. These are the happy memories of my childhood. I remember back in the day when we would go to the video store, and we would rent not just a movie, but we would also rent a VCR. Oh, I, well, I never had that. Oh, yeah, we had that for a while. No, I had a VCR. But yeah, th- th- this was a very, very, very special event. And uh, my parents would choose whatever movie they wanted. And uh, there would be like one family movie, and I loved Godzilla movies. And I got to pick out a Godzilla movie. It was so cool. God, I can't believe that you, you, had, a, you had to rent a VCR with the movie. You didn't have to. How the to. hell did you not have a VCR? They were expensive. They were expensive, but I mean, if you go to the movie store all the time, you should have just got a VCR. It did not last long. Eventually, we did. Okay. How about, how about back in the day where, like, if you were watching the movie and it all of a sudden stopped playing and then you had to pull the tape out and the whole actual magnetic tape got wrapped up in one of the spools and you, the, the video tape was ruined and you had to buy it? Yeah. God! Youngster today, what a life you live. Anyway. Anyway, he had one. Yeah. Should have used it as a weapon. That's how big those goddamn things were. I would much rather get hit with his tennis racket than by a VHS tape from 1986. He vowed the Midnight Express would unmatch the James Boys, and then Magnum TA and Dusty Rhodes would be suspended, perhaps indefinitely. At this point, David Crockett, who was back, <laughs> David Crockett says, we've got a great match for you. Let's go to the ring for a great match. The great match was Magnum TA versus Art Pritz. Yes. Here is, I promise you, here is everything that happened in this great match. Magnum TA reversed an Irish whip and one with a belly to belly. Yep. I left out nothing. Nope. (laughs) That's the match. You know, it was a great match because Magnum TA was involved and there was a belly to belly. (laughs) He did love that belly to belly. That is David Crockett's favorite fucking move. Yeah. Besides a double drop kick. Oh, we'll get to that, too. The Rock and Roll Express came out for a promo. Okay, seriously. <laughs> I thought it was hard to understand Nikita. Could you understand a word that Robert Gibson mumbled? A little. I, I literally, I couldn't understand a word he said. 
What a marble mouth. He's quiet, too. He's a quiet mumbler, which is a bad trait for promos. Uh, oh, wow. We're not broken up. We're in singles. Going to fight the horseman. And then Morton took over. Thank God. Yeah. And he ran into the horseman. Can I Can I say what, what Morton said? Because Yeah, yeah have at it. <laughs> he, so for those of you that have been paying attention, Ric Flair loves the word training underwear. Yeah. Okay. He loves to talk about the teeny boppers that love the Rock and Roll Express and how they're always out there in their training underwear. He likes to mention that he likes his girls big, double Ds. So Ricky Morton comes out, and I guess he's defending his love for the teeny boppers. I'm not sure, but he does make sure to make fun of Ric Flair for dating really big girls by coming out with the biggest pair of underwear in the world. Fat shaming, yes, to steal a modern term. All sorts of large ladies and getting a giant baby face pop in the process from all the young teeny boppers. That was weird. I don't even know what tent he cut up to make these out of. I bet he bought them. They were four feet tall. Yeah. It was weird. <laughs> Rage and Bull cut a promo in a very Michael Jackson top. Who does Manny Fernandez remind you of? He reminds me of somebody, and I just cannot figure out who it is. And it's not Manny Fernandez. Like every, a, a current wrestler? I don't know. Every time I see him, he just reminds me of somebody. It's driving me fucking crazy trying to figure out who it is. Every 1980s action-themed persona you ever saw? God! He had a small mullet, a mustache, and a bandana. That's ran, went around a lot. If anybody can find somebody that reminds me of Manny Fernandez, <laughs> I'll PayPal you 10 bucks. It's a unique one. So he was going on about Paul Jones and Jimmy Valiant when Boogie Woogie Man arrived. Okay, let me say something about this. How many times have you watched Raw and something really embarrassing happens and you're just so embarrassed that your family's in the room? A few times. It should be like that with the Boogie Woogie Man, but it's not. He showed up and Whitney was so filled with joy to see this oh, guy. Yeah, yeah. Everybody's watching him like, look at this awesome guy. He's got no eyes. He had some fucking weird hat on covering his eyes. He has bandana eyes. pulled way down over his eyebrow, yeah. Talking about T. Joe's con. T. Joe's con. <laughs> fucking everything up. Fernandez laughing his ass off. Yeah. All I know is Boogie Woogie arrived. He once again called Raging Bull Willy Willy. I don't know why. His name is Manny Fernandez, the Raging Bull. Somehow this turns into Willy Willy. And he threatened to make everyone bald-headed geeks. So you're trying to find logic in the Boogie Woogie Man. Yeah, Why? You're, you're right. <laughs> Why? He's <laughs> Willy Willy. I don't know. Ron Garvin versus Robert Burroughs. Burroughs was white and lumpy. And when Garvin threw him down... It was like watching a mannequin fall. <laughs> he just he just dropped. There's no, you know, when you take a bump, you want to like spread out your 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 back and and uh, keep your hips the hips and head off the ground. He just fell. Yeah, he just went down. And uh, Garvin beat him up a lot, put him in the sugar hold, tortured him for a while, including at one point where he had him in a he had him in a hammerlock and a half crab, and was standing on his head all at the same time. <laughs> And then he hit the big punch and he won. You know, the legend of Ronnie Garvin winning that NWA World Heavyweight title. I watch him out here every week beating the shit out of these jobbers and his sugar hold and just chopping them and pounding on them. And I think, you know, he would have been my champion. Maybe not for a long time, <laughs> but what the hell was wrong with it? If I understand that, like, it actually did tank business. But if you've got Ric Flair, and Ric Flair is going to be champion God knows how many times, and he loses the title here, loses the title there, I mean, is it really the end of the world? I guess I'm looking at it through modern eyes where everybody gets a title nowadays, but I look back at Ronnie Garvin and it's like, what the hell? He was awesome. <laughs> the hell was wrong with Ronnie Garvin, besides his promos? He did a hell of a lot better promo than Bailey and Nia Jax, I'll tell you oh, that fucking God, much. God, yes. Yes. 
and the sugar hold. And he did have the sugar hold. Midnight Express versus Rocky Canodal and Vernon Deaton. Last week, we watched the Midnight Express murder the Mulkies. I thought one of the Mulkies was dead, but I learned better later. Yeah. And I'm watching this. I think it was Deaton, but one of these men was awful. His time was terrible, like where they'd throw his head in the turnbuckle, and then he'd pause a beat and then sell. I expected them to just beat the crap out of him for being so lousy, but they didn't. They actually gave him some offense. Gave him some offense, but it was just a Midnight Express squash that they won with a rocket launcher. Forgettable. Tully Blanchard and J.J. Dillon cut a promo. Can I get a drop that just is me talking about how Tully is the best and how he looks and talks like a total superstar? I say it every fucking Tully week. Tully was awesome here. J.J. was just generic heel manager running down Dusty and the baby faces. And then Tully. Oh, Tully. Talks about Garvin and his taped fists. Says he didn't need to tape his fists to beat anyone because he was a great wrestler. And that's why he beat Garvin. When no one else could beat Garvin, I did it. Talks about his belt. Shows off. It says wrestling champion. It doesn't say punching champion. <laughs> he just went on about what a great champ he was and all his suits and all the money. And now no one could shut him up. And ah, oh, he was awesome. The best. Jimmy Valiant and Raging Bull versus Brody Chase and Jerry German. Valiant comes out, all the kids are hugging him, and he gets in the ring dancing, and he gets all of the little children to chant bald-headed geeks Yeah, in their little children voices. Yes. <laughs> it's like, like the like, Pied Piper. Like the children of the corn. <laughs> it's fucking hilarious. It was funniest actually later when they were doing it during a Dusty Rhodes promo. But this went, this is easily the longest Jimmy Valiant match we've seen. Obviously, he didn't do all the work. and uh, Or any of it. Well, he would tag in, do like an eye rake and a body slam and tag out. So the announcers start talking, and you hear him say, it's not on camera, but Paul Jones has emerged to watch this match. <laughs> and after a minute or so of this, they cut to a camera showing Paul Jones watching. It looks like, <laughs> keep in mind, this is 1986. This looks like uh, the, the raid on Bin Laden's co compound. It's dark. It's hazy. It's gray. They have put a camera on Paul Jones in the shadows and turned the exposure all the way up to try to get some kind of visual image. No, Vinny. Let me tell you something as a man who used to make movies. They didn't have to do anything. All you had to do was find a dark corner and film. You didn't have to change any settings. That's what it looked like. I see. I remember when we would film something and then like my buddy Chris Johansson would watch it back on another VCR. Because you had to take the tape out of the fucking camera, put it in the VCR, and That's then right. put it back. Yeah. And he'd go, God damn it. We got a white balance. And so you had to find a white fucking piece of paper and white balance it. Yes. So uh, the bull won with the flying burrito. Announcers hyped up the Great American Bash for a while. And then Arn Anderson joined them. He also hyped up the bash. He ran down the Rock and Roll Express. He ran down Dusty Roads and announced that the fourth horseman was on his way back. Road Warriors versus Ray Trailer and Carl Stiles. First animal hit Ray Trailer with a very violent shoulder block. <laughs> he was going to make sure this 350 pound man went down. And the match went on a bit. Baby Doll was out there with Paul on the ring. And Hawk, here's how they won. Hawk picked Styles up, put him in the Rick Rude backbreaker. Then he dropped to his knees. Then he pinned him. No Doomsday device, no other big double team, just that. And that was it. And then Jimmy Garvin beat Rocky King with a brain buster, maybe just as quickly. He joined Tony Schiavone for a promo. And this, what this, uh, they showed a video. It was Wahoo and uh, Garvin They're having a brawl at a house show. And we've been watching Jimmy now for two, three months. He wins the brain buster every week. And I always think, yep, brain buster, just a, just a move. He picked up Wahoo and hit a brain buster on the floor, and I thought he was dead. Oh, my God. It was brutal. He promised he had another video to show next week. For the Indian. For the Indian. I called him that a few times. Then he said, talked about that, that other loose woman who was out here, baby doll, that Jezebel. Out here with Paul Ellering, she's with a different man every week. Can't decide what man she wants to be with. She's not a real lady like Precious, who's always loyal to me. And they kissed, and Jimmy said, let's leave before that loose woman comes back out here. <laughs> God forbid. He can't be in the same room with her. Jimmy Garvin is so awesome. 
I have it in Nikita Koloff versus Bob Peters and Jim Dawson. Okay. <laughs> this was amazing. Dude, there's no way that Bob Peters and Jim Dawson were not young man and grandfather. This, I'm certain of it. This was Ivan and Nikita versus Bizarro World alternate universe versions of themselves. Everyone was decked out in red. He had one tall young guy, or yeah, one tall young guy and one short old guy. The biggest difference was Ivan and Nikita were big and scary, and Bob and Jim were white and pale and very, very skinny. What I loved about it was you got a young guy, a young fit feller, and then you had an old man. Yes, rickety. And I thought, okay, well, you know, if you're going to beat the shit out of one of them, you do a couple of holds with the old guy, he tags in the youngster, you beat the shit out of him, and then you beat him. Oh, no. They beat the shit out of the old guy. They picked him up. They dropped him head and face and neck first over the top rope. Oh, yeah. I thought they were trying to kill him. That, yeah. It looked like a deliberate attempt to kill a man. Went through the break. Yeah. Strong pro-communism match here. <laughs> it did they show. destroyed these two pale, horrible Americans. So Nikita won with a sickle. And then they cut a promo. They bragged about the six-man championship. And they called out Magnum T and the Road Warriors. So, yes, it was every Russian's promo we've ever seen. I did my father in law, Bob, was like, Russians. <laughs> You're like, that's right. Yeah. He goes, Man, they even have the hammer and sickle. He's very impressed. He's like, that's right. And these, the- these are communists trying to take over America in the wrestling rings here in the eighties. Yeah. It was so easy in the eighties because of the Cold War. Yes. You just had to have some Americans against some Russians. And as we saw later with the promo that uh uh, what's his face? Magnum? Magnum. Yeah. God, he was just like, all you do is cut a raging promo about America. Place goes crazy. By the way, going back to this, uh, my alternate universe theory here. Could there be a better U.S. versus Russia matchup than Ivan and Nikita versus Bob and Jim? And that's about it. Yeah. You know, another thing about I was just thinking about this. So, I realized that we did have, in the 50s and 60s, we had the Nazi characters. Yeah, yeah. Nowadays, I mean, you remember, like, Muhammad Hassan with that whole thing? I mean, there was so much heat that they essentially had to get rid of the character, and he was done in wrestling. Yeah. After playing that character for a while. But the Cold War was effective because it was a Cold War. Right. So, you could have these evil Russians... But it wasn't like you were taking advantage of, of... It never felt exploitive. Yeah, it was just like, these, these are bad guys that we're at a cold war with. That we are we are just trying to prove. That, it's like, this wrestling thing was like the, the moon race. We're just trying to show that our wrestlers are better than these goddamn Russian communist wrestlers. Yes. That was it. Yes. Shivani said it was time to announce the location of the 1987 Crockett Cup nearly a year early. That's right. They well, you know, Vinny. We learned that don't make your summer plans no. before we inform you as to where the Great American Bash is coming. That's right. So they brought in Gary Juster, <laughs> the Baltimore promoter. Gary Juster works for Ring of Honor nowadays, yeah. and so every time I go down for Mania weekend, I see Gary Juster. Yeah. And some guys you see, like if you met Jimmy Hart, he would look exactly like mm-hmm. Jimmy Hart. Yes. In the 80s. The 1980s version of Jimmy Hart looks like the 90s version looks like he does today. I could not believe 1986 Gary Jester. I was howling. I cannot wait to see him again <laughs> and talk to him about this show. They said he was the youngest promoter in the NWA. He was very successful, and they hyped up Baltimore as the host of the 87 Crockett Cup. And then he threw in a line about how there was a show in Baltimore that night, and you never know there might be a title change. Promoter doing one last plug on the morning before the show. That's why he's one of the best why young promoters the best in the NWA. So we had the Rock and Roll Express versus Gene Ligon and Randy Mulkey. And when only one Mulkey came out, you and I had the same thought. The other one has died. Yeah. After last week's match. We were wrong. Turns out we were wrong. These goddamn Mulkeys are durable. This match went 10 seconds. The... They were supposed to win with a double drop kick, but their timing is way off, so Gibson didn't even jump. He just stood there on his feet as Morton hit a drop kick, 
And then Gibson pinned him. You know, it's interesting. I mean, look at the Mulkies. I mean, hideous, right? Yeah. But this is not a universal statement I'm going to make. But in a lot of cases, if you're a lifetime natural athlete and wrestler and you never take drugs and you never take steroids, your body heals itself. You look at some of these wrestlers that got all gassed up and juiced up because, like, you're big and strong and thick and it's going to protect you from these bumps. And now they're just wrecks. They're tearing muscles left and right. Here, these goddamn yeah. mulkies are still around today. They're moving great. Yeah. They should have been dead. They should have died. Ric Flair came out and cut the most boring, low-key Ric Flair promo you ever saw. He spoke for, like, two minutes, and he was done, and I literally had no idea what he said. Mostly just put over his awesome wardrobe. The James boys joined Shivani for a promo. So the gimmick is, if you've not been paying attention, it is very obviously Magnum TA and Dusty Rhodes under masks. They claim to be Frank and Jesse James, a new team in town. And it's, like I say, it's Magnum and Dusty. They're just being angry. So they said they were outlaws. They would do anything imaginable to the Midnight Express. Then Dusty steps up and talks about Baby Doll. And this all started, of course, when Cornette hit Baby Doll in the belly with his tennis racket. And Dusty Rhodes, under a mask, says Baby Doll has had many strange affairs and has even attempted suicide. <laughs> what? <laughs> Where did that fucking come from? Then they threatened to strangle Jim Cornette to death. Yeah. What the fuck was this? You know, on a positive note, you remember when Hulk Hogan was Mr. America? Yes, that was awesome. God, I loved it. Oh. And it was funny because it's very obvious who the James boys yeah. are. Yeah. But you would think if this were real, that Dusty would at least try to hide his Dusty Rhodes voice. Yeah. If anything, he accentuated it. Yes. There was no attempt at subtlety here. The whole gimmick was... Not only are you supposed to know who we are, but we are blatantly flaunting it and playing it up. Yeah. I love it. Thumbing their noses. Only in professional wrestling can you have great entertainment like this. That's right. That's right. Shaska Watley and the Barbarian beat uh, Mike Samani and the other Mulkey. He's I cannot, alive. cannot express how disappointed I am with the Shaska Watley ball-bearing appearance on the show this week. They won with a top rope headbutt. I got nothing to add. Nothing. You know, when number one Paul Jones was in the shadows earlier, we didn't talk about what actually happened, which was <laughs> he appeared to be standing next to the bathroom because a fan just sauntered out and kind of moved out of his way and just went to his seat. Didn't even acknowledge this man dressed like a commandante yes. standing there watching the matches. <laughs> it's fucking hilarious. Live television. <laughs> Dusty Rhodes and Baby Doll appeared for a promo. Dusty said he sure was sorry to miss a chance to hang out with the James gang. Two shifts passing in the night, he said. They passed briefly in the locker room. Yeah, yeah. He ran down the horseman for a while, and Baby Doll threatened to embarrass Jim Cornette because embarrassment hurt more than physical pain. When did uh, Jim Cornette do the suicide joke? During the Midnight Express match. Oh, was it? Okay. Yeah. What a horrible... I don't even... I only heard the punchline... He was saying someone, someone, someone lived in a sewer, spent his whole life in a sewer, and died in the sewer. He committed suicide. That's right. And there's dead silence. And finally, the announcers just say, we're not even going to dignify that with a response. Baron Von Rasky quickly beat Tony Zane with the claw. Atrocious. <laughs> the, Baron, the Baron was a good wrestler. The Baron was not good throwing strikes. And so what did he do in this match? He came out and he threw a whole bunch of strikes. And it was fucking horrible. You got way more out of that match than I did. <laughs> I, couldn't, I couldn't stop looking at him. Yeah. Shivani interviewed Magnum TA, or he was going to. But before he could speak, Ivan Koloff arrived. I, your, your, your father-in-law took this all in so casually. Ivan Koloff explained he had a message for, for Magnum. From the Kremlin. From the Kremlin. <laughs> the Kremlin is very concerned about the negotiations involving their star athlete Nikita Koloff 
Sure. And Ivan Koloff is their liaison. Yeah. Fucking Americans beat him to the moon. They were very, very <laughs> angry. And they needed some semblance of years? revenge. <laughs> yeah. Till the wall came down, they were looking for revenge. <laughs> so the message from the Kremlin was they were prepared to sign Magna Magnus Nikita for the U.S. title in a series of Russian chain matches. Oh, man. But they had some stipulations. First, Magnum had to agree to do a press conference. Oh. Very important for the Kremlin. <laughs> you know it is. We got we to gotta promote these matches. Propaganda. It's exactly. Yes. This is Pravda here in the U.S. And I, I'm not sure if this is part of the stipulation or just a warning, but he wanted to make sure Magnum realized he was, in fact, an inferior athlete from an inferior country. <laughs> it's part of the stipulation. Yes. You should know that. You don't need to acknowledge it. <laughs> you, just, you just need to understand. You need to listen to me say it to you. Yes. Then he left. And so Magnum turns into the camera and can see fiery pro USA promo. He vows he's going to take on that commie. And then the show ended. That was a great promo. Sure. Man, Magnum could rage way better than Alex Riley. That's a fact. And yeah, that was it. Only an hour long. You know, I got to say, it's funny. Like, we watch Raw, and it's too goddamn long, and even SmackDown sometimes feels like it's too long, and everybody has always said, you know, the ultimate, the optimum length of a wrestling television show is 90 minutes. Yeah. And I've watched many NXT shows, I've watched many Lucha Underground shows, they've all been fine at one hour, but I will say... This was too short at an hour because they rushed through everything, and it was a bunch of useless segments. Yes. There's a, it's not yeah. like I needed more time for the Mulkies. No. But it would have helped a little bit. Cutting half of these segments out would have made this a better show. Sure. The, 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 these one-hour shows, this one, and the one-hour night shows we've been watching, they've been overloaded. They would have been worse at the same pace for two hours. It's like they're caught they're, off guard that they only have an hour. Yes. But they're not. Yes. Like the first night show we saw had three matches. Great. I was told, by the way... I that should go back and hey, talk for a minute. I was told that the Nitro show this week, this is from Filthy Tom Lawler, whose birthday is today. Happy birthday, Filthy. He said that the Nitro this week is much better. So, it kind of would have to be, but it was much better. What are you going back to look at the first few Nitros, see how long they were, or how many matches? No, eight. Uh, oh, nine. how many segments? There were 10 matches on this one-hour show. You know, that may be too many matches. That's too many matches. But they had all those guys there. We had to make sure they had some action. Everyone's got to get the shit in. You're going to be mine all night long. NWA Championship Wrestling, May 31st, 1986. Everyone watched this show. There was, I don't think, any good wrestling on it. I don't care. There was a lot of good promos, and Tully Blanchard here in 1986 cut the best promo of 2016. The show began with clips of the Midnight Express attacking the James gang and threatening or trying to unmask him, not unmask them, and we will come back to this later. See, Vinny, when they, when they finally played the actual footage, you thought it was so awesome. Mm -hmm. I just knew immediately. I didn't know who it was. But I knew they're going to unmask this guy, yeah. and it's not going to be one of the James boys. Yeah. Now, granted, if you give me a thousand years, I wouldn't have guessed who it was. because Who it was is frankly irrelevant. No, it isn't. It is irrelevant, Vinny, because this man, they beat the Midnight Express. That's what led to them getting in the ring and jumping them. I see. Yes. Yeah. All right. So, Dusty Rhodes and Baby Doll joined the announce desk for a promo. By the way, they announced this week the show is in stereo. Oh, yes. In stereo. Stereo. Cutting edge technology. Dusty hyped up his title match in D.C. during the Great American Bash, and he denied knowing anything about the James Boys. Hector Guerrero and Raging Bull versus Thunderfoot and Bob Owens. Your main man, Thunderfoot. My main man, main man David Crockett. They were doing the most basic stuff ever. Hector would do a body press, and Thunderfoot would catch him, and for a second he'd teeter and totter and then go down. Crockett was... His life hung on every twist of momentum in this match. And every time the baby faces had a move, it was like he'd won the lottery all over again. Just going crazy for everything. I like where Owens took a backdrop where he landed feet first, then ass, then shoulders, then head. 
That's the worst way to land. Exactly the wrong way to do it. Can somebody tell me what the theme song for Hector Guerrero and the Raging Bull really was? It's a very happy mariachi tune. Well, no, the the way that they played it. it I made, see. I mean, I could be wrong here, but the way that they played it made me think that this was a dub. And they right. just got generic mariachi music. I want to know if they played like La Bamba or something. It was 1986. What did they play here for these Mexicans? Hector looked exactly like Eddie Guerrero. He did here. It was creepy. And my dad. <laughs> and uh, Region Bull won with the Flying Burrito. Stunned by the number of flying ass attacks we had in wrestling in 1986. It's such a phony move. Yes. I'm going to throw you into the ropes, and I'm going to jump in the air and bend over. I'm going to jump in the air, turn around, and bend over, and you will end up in my buttocks, and this will knock you down. Yeah. But in the 80s, apparently, no one had a counter. No, there was no counter to an ass in your face. No. <laughs> so I've heard. Arn Anderson got a promo hyping up the Great American Bash. He vowed the Four Horsemen would return and promised that Ole Anderson was on his way back. You know, the show was only 54 minutes or something like that, but they were just going. This was another show. This was an example of a show where 90 minutes is a better length than 60 because the moment a match ended, they rushed someone in for a promo. Yeah. It's the quickest promo of all time, and then he rushed to something new. I, at various times throughout this show, was three or four segments behind taking notes. It was difficult to keep up with. Showed footage of Ricky Morton wrestling Ric Flair when he was attacked by Tully and Arn. And the payoff to this was the horseman holding Morton down as Flair hit knee drops to the back of Morton's head, driving his face into the mat and breaking his nose. Shattering his nose. Crushing his nose, I believe Ricky said. So then the Rock and Roll Express came out for a promo, by which I mean Ricky Morton came out for a promo and Robert Gibson came out and stood there. Okay, God bless Robert Morton, or Robert Gibson. <laughs> What the hell? He brought nothing to the table. He didn't do anything in the matches. No. I know this is not new information, okay? I've known this forever. Yes. But with each passing week, it's it's more and more glaring. Like, his buddy was attacked by Ric Flair. Ric Flair shattered his nose. Now, theoretically, with his nose shattered and his, his septum deviated... I mean, Ricky's voice could have been all fucked up. Where was Robert to step in one time and vow revenge for his buddy? Or to say one word? He didn't say a goddamn thing. You know, in hindsight, it's become a cliche in wrestling when a tag team breaks up and you argue about which man will be more successful as a singles wrestler. You say one of them will be Shawn Michaels and the other will be Marty Jannetty. This is not fair. No! Marty Jannetty was seriously outclassing Robert Gibson. The question is to be who will be Ricky Morton and who will be Robert Gibson. Again, nothing against Robert, but for years when the Rock and Roll Express was on the Observer Hall of Fame ballot, I remember when I was coming up, all I heard about whenever, because I did a lot of tag team matches and all of the old school guys Buddy and Tim and Ed Moretti and the Colonel, all these guys. Buddy Rose. Well, they, what do they all say? You've got to watch the Rock and Roll Express. Brian, you're a little baby face. Watch the Rock and Roll Express. Watch how they do tag matches. The best tag team wrestling you'll ever see. The Rock and Roll, blah, 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 blah. And so every time the Rock and Roll Express came up on the ballot, I was like, these guys have got to be in. All I hear about from these old wrestlers is, if you want to learn how to be a tag team babyface wrestler, you got to watch the Rock and Roll Express. Every year I would vote for them. Every year they wouldn't go in. Finally, they go in. Now, I'm watching all of this, and I'm like, should they really have gone in? <laughs> can we, it's one guy. Can we retrograde and take them out? I don't want to take them out, and I, I don't want to be that hard on Robert Gibson, because they were an awesome team. But really, I mean... Every week, it's just more and more. This was not shocking. A... <laughs> how one sided this was. Yes, this is not a 50 50 split. Not at all. This may have been 90 10. I used to think maybe like 70 30. Yeah. Now it's more like, seriously, 99 1. Yes. That's about where we're at right now. You know, thinking about this, I've seen a lot of great Rock and Roll Express tag matches where they beat up Rookie Morton for a while and he tags in Robert Gibson to do a finish. Would it have been any worse? If Ricky has made his own comeback, it may have been better. I don't know. So here he comes out. He's got the uh, Mankind mask on to protect his crushed nose. He's got two black guys behind the mask. And he says he they crushed his nose, but his nose is a long way from his heart. 
He's going to make it an eye what for an line. eye. He's going to make it an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. It was awesome. A mullet for a mullet. <laughs> And well, Robert didn't say one word. Didn't say nothing? He didn't, didn't even, He didn't even say, you tell him, Ricky. He didn't pound his fist into his palm? No. He didn't point at the camera? He came out, put his hands on his hips, stood there with a blank expression, waited for Ricky to say his piece, and then left. Wahoo McDaniel versus Vernon Deaton. I love that the graphic guy gets it right every single week. McDaniel. Wahoo McDaniel. And Dave David Crockett always calls him Wahoo McDaniels, as does everybody else. And and by the Why way... Why didn't they just call him Wahoo McDaniels? I don't know. Why did they even bother? I guess because he was famous. But... By this point, yes. The funniest thing about that is, David loved Wahoo. He just didn't love him enough to learn his name. All right, let me ask you a serious question that is a little more modern. Steve Mongo McMichael. Mm-hmm. Everybody called him Steve McMichaels. I mean, he was a famous member of the Chicago Bears and a Super Bowl winning team. Yeah. If they would have brought him up and just called him Steve McMichaels, would anybody have fucking noticed? Because probably <laughs> most people called him Steve McMichaels anyway, right? To be honest, that was before my time, but I can tell you, there was a guy who played for Atlanta named Keith Brooking. He played in the league for like 10 years. And nine times out of 10, the announcers would call him Keith Brookings. I don't know why people do this. <laughs> Because you just can't help it. So Steve Regal had joined the company. Not Lord Stephen Regal. No. Lord <laughs> Steve. <laughs> Brian. He wasn't fat. No. He just was which a very... Was he, actually a shame because that's a great nickname. He was definitely not Steve Regal. No. He put over Jimmy Garvin. He buried Wahoo. And then he left. <laughs> I'll, they'll do this sometimes in the show where someone will come out and cut a promo that has nothing to do with them. No, he was he was a friend of Jimmy Garvin, and he says that Jimmy's going to come take care of this Indian. Yeah. And that was it. And they left. And they said, well, Regal and Garvin are good friends. That's understanding it. Regal and Garvin beat the Road Warriors to win the AWA tag titles. They're so, yes, they were very, very good, good friends. friends. Now, can I, can I just talk about this match? Uh, sure. What happened was, Wahoo played around with him for a while. He put him in various holds. And then, suddenly, he just began chopping the shit out of him. And then, instead of dropping an elbow, he did everything you would do when dropping an elbow. But instead of dropping an elbow, he chopped his face and pinned him. That was fucking amazing. Here's everything I wrote about the match. They were out there doing nothing, and then Wahoo hit a bunch of chops and a falling chop for the win. Yeah. Okay. I liked it. Then came something awesome. This was the best. And you know what? It was everyone we've ever seen. But I don't know. I, I guess because they just shot it straight, it made it a thousand times better. There isn't like the irony nowadays where the guys do the thing and they just go, well, you know, there's going to be a fight here before this is all said and done, blah, 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 blah. These men went in here for a very professional contract signing for Magnum versus Nikita Koloff. Magnum brought his mother... <laughs> yes. And they played it straight. So here's what went down. This was, per the Russians' demands, the press conference to hype up the title match, the U.S. championship match between Magnum T.A. and Nikita Koloff. So Magnum's there, like all Americans, blue jeans, black t-shirt. Mom. His mother, did they, did they identify her until halfway through? No. Okay. I, I, first was, I thought it must be his attorney. That's what I thought, too. It was his yeah. management or something. There was a mystery woman sitting to his I mean, rights. maybe she is his attorney. We don't know. Could be. There was, uh, it was Sandy Scott moderating, right? Yes. Yes. And then the Russians are on the other side. Now, I mentioned uh, uh, Magnum's outfit of blue jeans and T-shirt. The Russians showed up to this press conference in white suits. <laughs> and not to be outdone, Nikita Koloff, white shirt, white jacket, white slacks, white shoes, no socks. Oh, yeah. Oh, Beautiful. <laughs> So, Sandy hands Magnum the contract, and Magnum cannot sign this quickly enough. No, he didn't even he didn't even read it. Flips to the back where his name is supposed to go, signs it, scribbles, passes it back. That's right. It could have been a contract for, like, his firstborn child. He didn't give a shit. A pound of flesh. Just signed it. So then they pass it over to the Russians. <laughs> Ivan goes line by line, <laughs> clause by clause through this thing. And then you notice something very funny about this. Yeah. I was typing. I would like glance up the screen. Listen, type, 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 type. And I could hear Ivan saying, yes, yes, this looks good. 
Yes, that is our demands. June 7. And then you rewound. I yeah. I couldn't figure out why. And you asked, why do they dub that? I didn't, didn't know what you meant. And then we went back, and as Ivan is speaking, his lips don't move. No. I think what happened, I think they filmed this, and I think that Ivan wanted to do a deal where he very carefully read over each line of the contract to make it seem like, this is a very serious matter. I want to make sure these Americans aren't fucking me. Well, not only that, but uh, it's it's a note of cowardice. Magnum couldn't wait to sign. Ivan was almost looking for an excuse to get out. I see. Yeah. Well, regardless, he goes through it, and I'll bet when it was over, they thought, well, you know, we want to get that spot in there, but fuck, it took him a long time to read that goddamn it's contract. 15 seconds of a bald man flipping the pages of a contract. So let's have him do some audio and we'll dub it in, yes. and we'll hope that Brian Alvarez isn't paying attention. In 2016. In 2016. I was fucking paying attention, and it was weird. <laughs> it was like I was reading his mind. I prefer to think we could hear his thoughts. He's a telepath now. So he finally approves the contract. He passes it to Nephew Nikita. Nephew Nikita signs. And then Sandy says, I understand the Russians have a prepared statement. And Ivan runs his mouth for a while, and it's the usual thing we've been hearing for six months now. On June 7th, on the Superstation at WTBS, you will you will see my nephew, a superior athlete. I wrote, you will feet my nephew. You will face my nephew? I don't know how I got face and feet mixed up. Anyway, he's going to defeat you for the U.S. title. Yes. And that's Nikita's turn. And I finally, for the first time, understood what Nikita was saying in a promo, and thank goodness. So Nikita wants to know why... Magnum had chosen to bring his mother to a contract signing. This is a goddamn good question. <laughs> Fantastic question. Unless what she is your is mom his doing attorney, here? why is she there? So he begins to talk about how Russian women know their place. They don't belong in matters like contract negotiations. They belong at home, in the kitchen, cleaning, all that stuff. And he says, this proves that Russian women have more class than a stinking American. A word of advice. Don't insult Magnum T.A.'s mother to his face. Magnum scrambles over the top of the table. There is no, like, stand up in a big dramatic flip. There's no moment of reaction. He goes from zero to 100 in an instant. Yeah. He is a wild animal. He's getting over the table to kill this Russian who has said bad things about his mom. Now, as he goes over this table, Sandy Scott had been between them. Sandy Scott ends up on the ground, and there is a chair on top of him, and he is buried and trapped. Yes. And nobody else gives a shit. No. The Russians double team and destroy Nikita, and Sandy Scott is struggling to unbury himself the entire time. I laughed so hard at Sandy Scott being buried underneath the chair in the middle of this brawl. Yeah. So the uh, Magnum reacted so quickly, he did not have time to think this through. There was two of them and one of him. And it ended up with them beating him up and lay, leaving him laying in front of his mom. Oh, man. Genius. This segment fucking ruled. That's all I got to say. All I got to say is there's better yet to come. It was not Shaska Watley versus Bill Mulkey. I love this. Okay. Shaska's in the ring doing a squash match. It was not Shaska Watley versus Bill Mulkey? Well, that's what it was, but that, this is not the better I was speaking of. I see. Yeah. They're in the ring to a squash match. Meanwhile, Paul Jones and occasionally Baron Von Raschke are at the podium doing a promo, which they show on the screen on the, the inset box, the little box in the yes. corner. So let me describe for you what is actually on camera, because they go to the match with a wide shot. So the top half of the screen is just the flags they hang at the top of the studio to make this look international. The lower right-hand corner of the screen is empty ring where there's no match happening. And the lower left-hand corner of the screen is Shaska Watley and Bill Mulkey doing stuff behind the inset screen of Paul Jones's head. And as you noted, Paul Jones by now has been doing this for a long, uh, long time. Let me talk about Paul Jones. He's doing commentary and they've got an inset. Everybody, you've got to go watch this. First off, Paul Jones, I think, knew that he was on screen because he's desperately trying to figure out where he's supposed to be looking. He looks right, 
he looks left, he looks up, he looks down, he looks towards this camera, he looks towards the other camera. He has no idea where he's supposed to be looking. Then, I think he thought the camera was no longer on him because he appears to go out of character for a moment. Then, somebody must have said and made some sort of motion like, you're fucking on he camera, did dude. The camera motion, everyone. <laughs> yeah. Because then all of a sudden he goes back into character again and he starts shouting that Bill Mulkey is such a coward because he's outside of the ring. And he screams, this man must be from this area. That's what he came up with. Yes. Not Atlanta, not Georgia. He must be from not the mid Atlantic. <laughs> this area. Fighting words. Paul Jones. Can we take Robert Gibson out of the Hall of Fame and put Paul Jones in as Ricky Morton's partner sure. in the Rock and Roll Express? <laughs> Why not? Then we'd beat we'd 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 kill two birds with one stone. Correct with a lot plan. of wrongs. Shaska won with a superplex. God, Paul Jones. He's like so bad, he's amazing. Rick Flair came out for a promo. And the first half of this was basically every every Flair promo you ever saw. He noted he had his custom-made suit, looking like only he can look, and looking a lot better than Ricky Morton. He said as good as he looked, he could still fight dirty, and that's what he had to be to be world champion. And he put the horseman over and arms the TV champion, until he's the national champion, always coming back. And it's very generic Ric Flair promo, which is very good, but nothing you haven't heard before. And then he stops, and David Crockett has backed away and wants nothing to do with this after they're attacking Ricky Morton. And Flair turns to David Crockett and says, David, I can tell you guys something to say. Why don't you ask me a question? Crockett steps up and quietly, solemnly asks, why did it take four of you? <laughs> That's his question. Yeah. And Flair laughs and says, you think it took four of us to beat up Ricky Morton? He says, he says, go back and watch. I had things well in hand, and Tully and Arn showed up to congratulate me on my victory, and they were only there to do that until Morton attacked them. That's so awesome, because that is so clearly a lie. But it makes it great. I love when he said, they wanted to know, why did you do this to Ricky? You attacked this man, you beat the shit out of him, and you shattered his nose. Why? What makes you think that you had the right to do that to Ricky Morton? And Ric Flair's response was, I did that to Ricky Morton. Because Ricky had the audacity to think that for even one day in his life, he could be half the man that I am. That was his entire justification. Oh, yeah. Ricky Morton thought on one day that he could be half the man I am. Therefore, he deserved for me to beat his ass and break his nose. Mm -hmm. And finally, he says, I guess to prove he's not all bad, he has a gift for Ricky and Ricky's fans. And he pulls out a bikini that he says would fit the uh, typical Ricky Morton fan. And he pulls out a bikini that I believe your daughter Paisley may have outgrown already. Oh, I, was, I wrote that same thing. It's too small for Paisley. Yes. There's no way she would have fit into this. No. I don't even know where he got it. <laughs> a Barbie doll. Had to an, have been custom made. An actual literal Barbie doll. And then it got better. I could talk for, I think, three hours about this Tully Blanchard promo. J.J. Dillon and Tully Blanchard come out for a promo, and they are giddy. They can't wait to show and tell everyone how great they are and how they how they bettered their, their enemy. They're bragging about Tully Blanchard being the first man to ever knock Ronnie Garvin out. And they go to video. It's at what would now be called a live event. It's going to be Ronnie Garvin versus Leo Burke, who they claim many times a Canadian Golden Gloves champion. Very important to note that. Mm -hmm. So before the match can start, out comes, Tully, uh, out comes Dylan and Tully Blanchard, who is in street clothes and his arms in a sling. And they're talking, by the way, they always have a backup. They always have a plan and a backup plan and a backup plan for the backup plan. So they come out to interrupt this match or delay this match. And... I'm not quite sure. I guess their first plan was Leo Burke would actually knock Ronnie Garvin out on his own, perhaps with their moral support. They go to the floor and they go to watch the match. And Leo Burke gets his ass kicked by Ronnie Garvin. Plan A failed. Plan A did fail. So they go to the backup plan, which is the ref gets bumped. Dylan hits the ring to try to knock Garvin out with a loaded shoe. Oh, that that's right. That's what the uh, 
Blanchard and Dylan were there to talk about Ronnie Garvin's knockout power, and they based, they dared him, and him they dared him and Burke to face each other in a knockout match. You must win by knockout or submission. That's that's what happened. See, so much was going on. I forgot to write that down. All right, so the ref gets bumped. Dylan goes to the backup plan. He goes to hit Ronnie Garvin with a shoe. Garvin ducks. Dylan KOs Burke, and Garvin then shoves Dylan into Blanchard, who was on the who had been on the apron and then went flying. So the ref counts Burke out, gives him a 10 count, he's knocked out, Garvin wins. So plan A failed, plan B failed, it's time to go to plan C. And Blanchard hits the ring. He tears off his sling. Guess what? His arm's not broken, and his fist is all taped up. Just like Ronnie Garvin had his fist taped up for months, and the horseman claimed it was unfair and gave him an unfair advantage. So he jumps Ronnie Garvin, and he's managed to beat the fuck out of this man with his taped fist. And as the video is showing him punch the snot out of Garvin with his taped fist, he is in the studio screaming, squealing, and quoting Dusty Rhodes. It's just tape. It's just athletic tape you can buy at any store. It's just tape like you see in every sport. Nothing to complain about. It's totally fair. And he punches him and punches him and punches him. And also, by the way, as he's showing this beating, he says, Ronnie Garvin likes to call himself the hands of stone. You know what? There's another man who called himself Hands of Stone, a boxer named Roberto Duran. You know what he's most famous for? In a fight against Sugar Ray Leonard, he said, no moss. He quit. He quit. And here, here I'm beating up Hands of Stone, Ronnie Garvin, and I hit him with my pile driver, and as I'm standing over him, no one else could hear this, but I can hear him whisper. And Ronnie Garvin looked up, up at me, looked up at me and whispered, I quit. Over and over and over again. As he was stretched out, there's nothing Magnum T.A. could do about that. Nothing Dusty Rose could do about that. I knocked out Ronnie Garvin. I made him say I quit. This should be required viewing for everyone who enjoys wrestling in any way. This was a masterpiece from start to finish. This was brilliant. This was fantastic. This is mandatory for you to see. Now, here's my question. I realize that he was Ricky Morton's tag team partner. But how is Robert Gibson in the Hall of Fame and fucking Tully Blanchard is not? I don't know. This man is fucking amazing. Promo ability, working ability, everything. God, he's great. Every single week, he's awesome. This was the best. This was amazing. This was. I, I, I'm still blown away by how fantastic that was. Every, note perfect from start to finish. Midnight Express versus Art Pritz and Brody Chase. Ray Trailer has now joined Jim Cornette as a bodyguard named Big Bubba Rogers. That's right. No reference to this man has... Was on a 14 match losing streak, whatever it is. He's just a no, new not, guy. Not even that, not even that. But later, Jim Cornette explains this man has been a childhood friend. That's true. He has protected me, protected my mother. He always, if we ever have a problem, we just call Big Bubba Rogers. They have totally repackaged a total jobber mm -hmm. because they found out he was a very, very talented jobber. So Big Bubba has taken the leap. Yeah. Congratulations to him. It's great. So Cornette's out there hyping up bunkhouse matches against the James Boys and the Midnight Express won with the skull-crushing finale in the top rope elbow. And the only other notable thing is that Brody Chase so royally screwed up taking the skull-crushing finale and Condry just scowled at him. And I thought this man was doomed, but they just hit the elbow and pinned him. Then they all joined Jim Cornette for another promo. I guess the same promo just kept on going. Here's where he explained Big Bubba had been doing dirty work for Mama Cornette. If they, if they needed a debt collected, I do want to say very quickly before you get to that that the great Bobby Eaton was fucking phenomenal on this show. He's always great, but he was flying all over the place. Uh -huh. He was awesome here in this random squash match against Art Pritz and Brody Chase. Indeed. God, he was great. So they explain who Big Bubba is. They move on to the James boys. This, of course, is who Big Bubba is there to protect Cornette from. Then they show the clip that opened the show It's in, in its entirety. Now, as you noted, this all started when a mass team named the James Boys surprised the Midnight Express and beat them in a match. That's right. So here they are. They claim it's Dusty and Magnum under masks, and they've been told if they can prove that, then Dusty and Magnum will be suspended for an undetermined amount of time. So they attack the James Boys. Who After the James Boys had won. I believe they were fighting the Mulkies. I'm not sure. But they attack the James Boys. They're tearing them apart. They get one in the ring. They're working together, all three of them, to, to get his mask off. And they finally tear it off. And it's Tony Zane. Tony Zane. 
Because as you noted, it now appears, or at least that we are led to believe, that Tony Zane was one of the men under the masks that beat the Midnight Express. That's right. Dusty and Magnum hit the ring unmasked just to laugh at these men for believing they could ever be the James boys. Come on now, that's just silly. And they go back to the studio, and Cornette is throwing a tantrum. He is crying. It was so great. Everything that you talked about with, with Tully Blanchard and how they were so happy to have gotten their revenge with their plan A, B, and C. This was the exact opposite. The heel had such a diabolical plan. We're going to sneak in after these idiots win a squash match, and we're going to unmask them. We're going to do a three-on-one, unmask them, and show the world it's really Dusty Rhodes and his partner, Magnum T.A., and they fucking go in there, and they unmask the guy, and it's Tony Zane. Now, we know, and Cornette knows, and the whole world knows who the James boys really are. But Cornette had been outsmarted, and he is fucking furious. Oh, yeah. He's so angry that we all fucking know who they are. It doesn't matter that when I unmasked him, it was Tony Zane. We know who they... And he's fucking... He's purple. The whole world's against me, he's he screams. He's purple with rage. <laughs> yes. He's crying. He's screaming. He's ranting. And out comes Baby Doll. Yes. And she's cutting, giving them a wide berth. She's not in their space, necessarily. But as soon as they see her, they have to hold Jim Cornette back. <laughs> they grab him. And Baby Doll explains she has a challenge... If Cornette thinks he's so tough, he can put some tights on, she'll put some tights on, and we'll see who's the best at the Great American Bash. She leaves. Cornette accepts this immediately, varying no woman would ever beat a man in a wrestling match. His exact quote was, No woman in the world can beat a man in a wrestling match. You want me in the ring, you fat hog. You got it. Yes. Wow. They go to commercial. They come back, and Jimmy Garvin and Precious are out there for a promo. And Jimmy begins running down Baby Doll, calls her a loose woman, as he has in the past, a Jezebel, as he has in the past. And then he had a new comment when he said, she's like a cumulus nimbus cloud. <laughs> cool. He says, Wahoo McDaniel has gone insane and gotten goofier. Claimed Wahoo had been cruising his neighborhood and peeking in windows. And then things got uncomfortable. And he said, if back in the day, if you didn't pick enough cotton, they tied you to a tree and they whipped you. Ouch. <laughs> That's awkward. I'm not sure how it applies to Wahoo. But Jimmy's delivery in this promo was fantastic. The Rock and Roll Express defeated David Dellinger and Paul Garner with a double drop pick in four seconds. Yep. The Russians cut a promo. They actually showed a replay of the double drop kick. I guarantee you that replay took more time than the actual. That was bell the point yes. because the replay was in slow motion. It was longer than the match itself. Yes. The Russians cut a promo. They vowed that Crusher Khrushchev would return soon. Ivan said Magnum had insulted them by bringing a woman to such an important event as their contract signing, and then Nikita mumbled for a while. Baron von Rasky and the Barbarian versus Italian Stallion and Rocky King. There was something in this match we'd never seen before. I, I've seen it one other time. That I, I'm pretty sure one other time in my life. The Barbarian picked up Rocky King and had a one-handed press slam. Yeah. The only other time that I can remember seeing this, it was the big show doing it to Rey Mysterio. Yes. These two men are much closer in size. This is why I always loved the Barbarian and Meng when they were together. Just big, powerful dudes and... You know, there's a technique to lift a man. Sure. If you want to see the, the technique to lift a man, watch Jason Jordan. He will show you the proper technique to lift and throw a man. Barbarian will show you how to not do it properly, but still execute it <laughs> so in the ugliest strong, manner possible. It doesn't possible. matter, yeah. I'm just going to catch you in whatever cattywampus way that I catch you, and then I'm going to fucking throw you. That's what he did. Uh -huh. He was so strong. He picked up King for this pressed lamb and quickly realized, I don't need both hands to do this, and he put his hand down. And he held him up there, and he slammed him. The other big spot was uh, Baron's new gimmick is he's got a mystery glove, which he uses. To, he, he puts it on, hits one punch, and then takes it back off. And then Barbarian wins with a diving headbutt. should mention that during this match, they put on the screen that they had a 
Great American Bash hotline number. Oh, yeah. A special hotline that you could call to get all of the information about the Great American Bash Tour in 1986. They bleep out the number, but they do leave on the screen the information that you can only call from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. Eastern. If you are in Los Angeles and it's 225 and you want bash tickets, tough luck. They didn't have a fucking answering machine no. or a voice mail of some sort in 1986. You actually had to call and talk to a human being to so. get all the information you wanted about the Great American Bash. Yes. Oh, my God. Thank God I'm not that old yet. Well, on that note, it was time for the Great American Bash update. They showed a skydiver landing in a field, I guess, from the year before. But they're at a packed outdoor stadium show, and there's skydivers and fireworks and all the country music stars, everything they promised. And they have a message from NWA President Bob Geigel for Ric Flair, really for everyone. Explains the Bash is going to be a 14-city tour. And on this tour, Ric Flair is going to defend the title on every single show. That's right. 14 title defenses in 30 days, he says. A grueling schedule for any champion. And then they have a big question. Mm -hmm. Flair is going to defend the title 14 times in 30 days. Very difficult, even for a champion as great as Ric Flair. Sure. What happens if someone beats Flair for the title? Well, I'm glad you asked. Because they explained it here. They said if anyone is fortunate enough to defeat Ric Flair and win the World Heavyweight Championship, they will take on the burden of those title defenses, and they will headline the rest of the tour. Wow. Fending as they go. Shocking. Yeah. You know Bob Geigel lived to be 90 years old? He just died like a year and a half ago. Good for him. That's very good for him. And he said this is going to be a great event, a great tour. He congratulated Jim Crockett on putting together this is a marvelous tour. Ron Garvin defeated Kent Glover in 30 seconds with a knockout punch. And then Cornette returned for another promo. First, he's got more to say about Baby Doll. He repeats, no woman, not even a big fat woman like Baby Doll, can wrestle a man. And he vows he's going to send her to the kitchen. And he starts talking about how big and scary Bubba was. And then he turns his wrath on Bob Geigel. Because sure, Geigel's got all kinds of things to say. All, all nice words when you're talking about skydivers and rock stars and fireworks and baseball stadiums. But when it comes to doing his damn job and suspending and firing people, he's nowhere to be seen. And he's ranting and ranting and ranting. He's just on a roll. And finally, Shivoni has to pull the mic away and say, we'll see you next week. And Corona has slaps the podium and says, yes, we will. <laughs> God, what a great show. This was me. The, the, the one Christmas show that had like the Flair Garvin match. That was the best of these shows we've watched. This may have been the second best. Hey, this is great. Excellent. Excellent show. And I would suspect as we head into the Great American Bash Tour, we'll have a bunch of other great shows as well. One can only hope. I'm very excited.